From its opening scene through to its dramatic conclusion, Final Fantasy VI was nothing short of a masterclass in set-piece design and narrative structure. Led by Yoshinori Kitaze, who had been promoted into the role of event director, the team of writers at Square were able to craft a story that, despite being centred around what could be considered an excessive abundance of playable characters, still enabled many of them to leave a lasting impression. And this was because compared to the previous Final Fantasy games, it represented a significant departure in terms of the way the story was told. Upon the arrival of Final Fantasy VI, the narratives we had seen were becoming progressively more complex, but they were still quite derivative of each other. Crystals would always be the central focus, as would Warriors of Light. And as these Warriors of Light underwent their quest to try and save the world, a one-dimensional path would be laid out so that the group, led by the main protagonist, could tackle each problem as a collective. Final Fantasy VI challenged this established norm. There were no more crystals, no more Warriors of Light, and no more following of that one-dimensional path. Instead, there was a real focus placed on character development. This saw the plot shifting between the perspective of different characters, with no defined main protagonist, and the passage of time became a more defined plot device. But one of the strongest tools the writers had at their disposal was the set piece, or event scene. These were woven into the story to create defining moments, and this related to both the playable cast, but also the various antagonists that would be encountered along the way. Now, to be clear, the use of the set piece was not a new concept. Final Fantasy V had the battle at the big bridge, and Final Fantasy IV had the conclusion of Mount Ordeals where Cecil shed his darkness to become a paladin. But in each of these instances, the set pieces were very minimalistic and short, often being preceded by a dungeon or some kind of gauntlet. Final Fantasy VI raised the bar. From the outset, this was clearly the plan. Tsukasa Fujita and Kaisuke Matsuhata were designated as specific event planners, and they worked alongside Yoshinori Kitase and the other staff members responsible for individual character development to ensure event scenes were well formed. And it was by taking this approach, which saw a significant amount of time, resources and focus dedicated towards this new objective, that they were able to make events that were memorable and impactful, to the point where they are even fondly remembered to this day. What was impressive is that they weren't just isolated instances either. This new approach permeated throughout the entire game, and this change in direction would have been obvious to players almost as soon as they booted the game up thanks to the cinematic opening scene. This featured the typical exposition. Similar to what had been seen in previous games, the player was given some kind of backstory to explain the current state of affairs and set the scene, but where it differed was that instead of jumping straight into the action, it was more structured with multiple parts and layers. Right after the overview, we were greeted with a small sequence that featured three unknown characters talking about an unknown task they were attempting to complete, and we then got to see them venture across a snowy landscape riding atop their Magitek armor in a scene that was used to showcase many of the individuals who had helped to make Final Fantasy VI a reality. It created quite the visual spectacle, and when combined with Nobuo Uematsu's opening theme, which unlike every prior audio track that had accompanied the opening monologue, actually followed the on-screen action, it set the tone for everything that would follow. Throughout the experience, many other set pieces would be used to evoke an array of emotions from the player, and they would also be used to help them learn much more about each of the characters, as well as the roles they were meant to play. And what was impressive is that these sequences didn't just focus on the group who were often denoted as the main characters. One such set piece would happen as the wider narrative was still being established. And even though Terra, Locke, Celes, and Edgar had all been introduced by this point in the story, none of them were present. Instead, the focus was placed on Cyan, Shadow, Sabin, and Kefka, as they took part in an event sequence dubbed The Siege of Doma. It was through this sequence of events that we got to see just how ruthless the Gestalian Empire were in their pursuit of world domination, and it provided an important frame of reference for not just Kafka Palazzo, who would end up being the game's main antagonist, but also Cyan Garamond, a future protagonist who showed his resolve and honour, but ultimately ended up losing his wife, child, and many of his compatriots owing to Kafka's despicable actions. But amongst the other prominent events, such as the escape from Figaro Castle, the defeat of Humbaba, and the raid of the Esper world, 
none quite hold a candle to the Opera House. This was used, as so many other set pieces have been done beforehand, to introduce a brand new character, enhance the player's understanding of an existing one, and provide some depth. In this case, the two characters of focus were Setsa Gabbiani and Sella Cher, but there was also room for the supporting cast to supplement the experience, with Lock Cole and Ultros both playing their part to make this a memorable occasion. It should also be noted that even though other protagonists were present throughout the sequence, they were absent from dialogue to keep everything much more focused. Taking place after the conclusion of the three scenario segment, where focus was placed on building out the characters of Terra, Locke and Sabin, the Opera House event scene served as the catalyst for everything that would follow. But it was also layered with so many subtle elements that tied into the wider narrative, making it quite the treat. Realising that they would need an airship to take any kind of meaningful stance against the Empire, the protagonists decided to target the Blackjack, which was owned by a well-renowned gambler who went by the name of Setzer. As they were attempting to devise the plan, the party came upon the information that Setzer had become infatuated with an opera singer named Maria, and that he was planning to kidnap her during the next performance of Maria and Draco. Realising that Celes had an uncanny resemblance to the actress who played Maria, they formed a plan that would see Celes take centre stage in the opera performance, all with the hope that she would be kidnapped by Setsa, giving her access to the Blackjack. With the plan set, each of the pieces started to move into position. Celes attempted to learn her lines and brush up on her singing, her allies took their seats in the stands, and a nefarious character firmed up his plans. And then, the opera began. What then made everything that followed so special was that it wasn't just a case of sitting back and watching the opera play out. There were many individual elements that contributed to make this a fantastic event sequence that would be remembered fondly for years to come, and they were woven in with real grace. Not long after the curtain was raised and Draco had delivered the opera's opening lines, the player then took charge of Locke. This was an interesting decision, as it placed the actual opera into the background almost as soon as it had begun. But it was a purposeful decision nonetheless, as by diverting away, the writers were able to provide Locke and Celes with a moment. It was here, even though there were only a few lines of dialogue, that we learnt that Locke was really developing feelings for Celes, and that she was beginning to do the same. But also, we learnt of the lament that Locke felt about what had happened to his former love, Rachel. As the pair parted, we then heard Celes sing Aria de Mezzo Caratare, with required interaction from the player, and this song had a striking intentional resemblance to Celes' theme. The lyrics, which were written by Yoshinori Kitase and translated by Ted Woosley for the SNES version, also related to one of the game's overarching themes of What is Love? To build upon the previous scene, these lyrics also alluded to the budding romance that was developing between Celes and Locke as they made reference to Rachel's fate. As the opera continued to play out, we learned that the perfect plan had encountered a hitch. Ultros, who had been introduced earlier in the game as the comedy act, a classic character in traditional opera, planned to interrupt proceedings by taking revenge for his prior defeats and in classic style, he informed the party of his plans so that they could attempt, in vain of course, to stop them. The execution of his plan should have been a simple task, but Ultros had underestimated the effort required to enact his revenge, and despite some annoying vermin and sewer rats, this gave the protagonists a chance to try and stop him. And stop him they did, but in doing so, they ruined the opera by falling from the rafters and flattening the two heroes. Everything at this point was unravelling, the crowd was angered, and it seemed as though their plan to snare Setzer would never work. But then something unexpected happened. Protagonist and antagonist alike decided to play into the charade, with Locke becoming a new hero who would fight for Maria's hand, and Ultros choosing to take up his role as the villain so that he might still enact his revenge. And thus, a rather unexpected boss fight ensued, complete with accompaniment from the orchestra. With Ultros defeated, Setsa then made his grand entrance, sweeping Maria away, and with this important part of the event concluded, the Empresario revelled in what was happening by revealing that part 2 was about to begin, alluding to what would be their literal attempt to try and steal Setsa's airship. 
In total, the opera segment of this event scene wasn't actually that long, around 10 to 15 minutes, and there was not that much dialogue. But what happened was very important to the development of the characters that featured throughout. Up until this point, Celes had been cold and distant. We saw how callous she was in response to Terra's questions about her ability to love, but the opera represented the start of her transformation, although it wasn't actually as clear in the original Snare's translation. In response to Locke's declaration, we saw Celes say, somewhere inside, you were saving her, weren't you? But in the Game Boy Advance retranslation, Celes instead said, am I just a replacement for her? suggesting disappointment at how Locke had portrayed his actions. After this sequence, as Celeste was required to show emotion on the stage, we saw her open up much more. She was forthcoming with her feelings, and it positioned the Opera House as a pivotal moment for her character development, something that would make sense as Kitaze was the writer assigned to building out her character and integrating her into the wider story in a meaningful way. Music also played an important part in the opera sequence, Noboro Uematsu composed the piece to accompany the action, and it comprised numerous acts that mirrored what was happening. Overture played as the opera was starting, Aria de Mezzo Caritare underscored Maria's aria, Wedding Waltz Jewel played as Maria and Rouse shared a waltz before they were interrupted by Draco, and Grand Finale played during the subsequent battle against Ultros. This track has since become one of the most popular pieces of music from the soundtrack and has been performed by numerous orchestras around the world, just adding to its legacy. And this, along with the comedic and subtle elements of character development, have helped to make the Opera House one of the most memorable event sequences in the history of the franchise. And we hope that you have enjoyed this exploration into what makes it so special. And it's at this point that we'd really like to thank Adam Aguilara who supports us on Patreon for recommending this topic. It was really fun to take a look back at this scene and really delve into what makes it so great. But we'd really like to hear your thoughts as well. So let us know in the comments below how you feel about the Opera House. And if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that like button and feel free to subscribe to our channel. All right, guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Raining Ekam, Logan Nijay, and Benjamin Snow, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.